Let's give him another hand for a wonderful, wonderful job. Passover. Passover. And Passover, 
just for the historical record, Passover has to do with the time that the Jews were in bondage, in slavery in Egypt. And the Lord sent ten plagues. And what he did is that he took the blood of the lamb and he scattered it on the houses of the Jews so that when the plagues came by, those who had the blood scattered would not be affected by the plagues. Amen. So that is called Passover. The plagues were going to pass them over and they were going to be preserved. Now, that has become a traditional historical event that even lasts to this day. And it lasts for seven days. And they do certain rituals during that period of time. Well, it just so happened that all of the people in the nearby towns had gathered for Passover celebration in Jerusalem when something happened that interrupted their celebration. They had been planted and they had staged a great event and gathering. And then something happened. Well, what happened, preacher? It just so happened that on that particular day, Jesus came to town. Amen. Jesus came to town. And this is why it says at that very first verse, when he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. Now, in that very first verse there, this is what is happening. When it says that when he had said this, he had said something prior to saying what he's about to say. And he has informed them that he was aware of the fact that going up to Jerusalem would result in <coughs> crucifixion for himself. But isn't it interesting? Even though he knew that, he went on to Jerusalem. Now let's be back. When you know you're going to be crucified, you're not going to go to Jerusalem. You're going to go in the opposite direction. But Jesus Christ knew that he had been sent in the world for a specific purpose. And going to Jerusalem was part of fulfilling that purpose, that purpose for which he had been sent into the world. So this was a critical week, not only in the life of the people at that time, but it is still critical in our life today. We are still celebrating that decision that Jesus made to go into Jerusalem. Now notice, he carefully planned it. He says, now when you go in there, you're going to find a colt. Now, just for the record, a colt is a young donkey. He's not really strong yet and all of that, but it says that this particular coat would be waiting on Jesus. And when you go in there, if anybody say that they want to interfere with you bringing that coat to them, tell them that the Lord has need of it. Now it seemed like Jesus had prearranged that. Or else the coat just knew that God was sending for him. But nevertheless, the coat came back with the disciples and it was not interfered with. Here's what I want you to understand, is that Jesus was going into Jerusalem, and he wasn't just going into a place where people really loved him. As a matter of fact, they had a contract out on him. The Pharisees had told people, I don't care where you find him, make sure that you bring him to us, and we are going to get rid of him once and forever. Now, he knew that, but in spite of all of that, he still went into Jerusalem. That speaks about the courage of Jesus. Yes. That speaks about how courageous he was knowing the situation that was waiting for him. You see, this trip into Jerusalem, it would change the whole world. Amen. This trip to Jerusalem, it would cause millions of people to still go to Jerusalem. I was in Jerusalem, and I was there that day because Jesus went 2,000 years ago into Jerusalem to be crucified. This journey would lead to salvation. The salvation that we have right now, that we have received, is a result of that decision that Jesus made on that day to go into Jerusalem. 
as Jesus went into Jerusalem, a lot of things began to happen. And one of the things that happened is that the people began to recognize who he was. When he entered into Jerusalem, he didn't come as a conquering warrior. Normally, the warriors, they came in with all of their troops and soldiers and armory, but he decided to go in on a coat, riding on a coat. The only thing that he had was a coat, and people were throwing palm leaves at him. He had no weapon, but when he came to Jerusalem, he came as the Prince of Peace. Not a war, but a peace. He came as the victorious Christ. And his coming into Jerusalem meant something. You see, when a lot of people come into your city and they want to conquer something or have conquered something, they want to do this. They want to take over the town and control it in a sense. But not Jesus. Jesus he came with a victory of humility, not a victory of pride. He came with a victory of gentleness, not a victory of rage. And we should learn something right now because as we listen to all of our politics, everybody's mad. Everybody's fighting. Everybody's trying to start a fight. Nobody has anything good to say about anything. But Jesus, he came symbolizing that he was the king of kings and he was victorious. And I say to you right now, one of the things that is most interesting in his decision to come is that in the book of Zechariah, at the ninth chapter and the ninth verse, there, there the prophecy is made that this day would take place. And that is one of the wonderful things about reading the scripture, is that you see a prophet say something a thousand years before it happens. Zechariah says, he says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is victorious, he is humble, and he's riding on a coat. He came on a coat, and listen to this. The Bible says that nobody had ever sat on this before. Now what does it mean? It means that there are some things that are reserved for Jesus and Jesus only. There's some things that only God has reserved for himself and this prophecy came true. And let me tell you right now, look for your king to come in your life. Look for Jesus. Jesus is still coming. He doesn't have to be coming in a physical form. But many of us have met him in the spiritual form and he have came into our lives. Anybody know what I'm talking about? He is still coming into our lives and he's bringing victory into our lives right now. So let me tell you something. As we read the scripture, it tells us that we need to be obedient to God's will. The disciples, they didn't question what God was doing. They just went and obeyed the instructions that they had received. They were told to go and get a coat, and we should be able to and willing to go and do whatever God wants us to do. And God will, the God will make everything turn out right in your life if you just obey Him. A lot of times God comes to us and we want to know why. We want to question Him. No, God knows the outcome before the event even takes place. He knew that the coat was going to be there, and he knew that the owner was going to allow it to come. So don't you interfere with God's plan. You just do what God tells you to do, and God has already worked it out on the other side. And I'll tell you something else. We got to be aware of something when we read the scripture here is that they were planning a Passover celebration. But sometimes, when you make plans, God will interfere with your plan. Amen. God will come in and change your plan. Yeah. And what you need to learn how to do is respect God's time. Amen. Respect God's time. Whatever he arrived 
and make an appointment in your life, you put away everything else and respect his timing because it teaches us the importance of trusting God, trusting his timing in our lives and to be patient for his plan. A lot of times people have made plans, but your plans don't necessarily have to go through. God has to check them out and see if he's going to allow them to go through. You know, the old people used to have a saying, I used to love to hear them say that. They would tell the people that I'm coming over to your house. And they live down in the country area, you know, and he says that, and I'll be there tomorrow if the creek don't rise. If the creek don't rise. And they say that the creek could rise because God could make the creek rise and prevent them from going through with their plan. So what I come by to tell you this morning is that when you make plans, make sure you check in with God because the creek might rise and you can't do what you think you want to do. And so we got to respect God's timing. Amen. Then you got to learn how to be humble in the Lord. Just do what he wants to do. Amen. We should serve him with humility and not with selfishness. This is what the disciples demonstrated when they just went and got the coat. And then another thing that we all need to do, especially on this day, listen and think about the title. We need to understand and recognize that Jesus is the king. Amen. 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 Jesus is the king. I don't care who's the president, whether he's Putin in Russia, whether he's Biden in the United States, that in Yahoo, in Israel, Jesus is the king of kings. He's the king of the world. And the Bible says that one day every knee shall bow. Everybody shall bow down to Jesus because he is king. And that's when he rode into town, the people recognized him as king. And they began to shout what we should shout about. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. He's not coming in the name of military power or anything like that. He's coming in the name of the Lord. And we should acknowledge him. We should submit to his authority and allow him to be king in our lives. Amen. Let's celebrate when we come to worship. Amen. Amen. Let's celebrate. Let us be happy. Those people were happy because Jesus showed up. Let's celebrate. Don't be afraid to be happy when you're serving the Lord. Don't be afraid to express how your heart is feeling and show gratitude and adoration for Jesus is King. Jesus is King. And he has done so, so much for us. Praise his holy name. Praise his holy, holy name. Thank you. Let's look at this next verse of scripture. Verses 35 through 40. Luke 35 through 40. And this one here is talking about Jesus' royal reception. It says, Then, as he was coming, then they brought Jesus, they brought him to Jesus. Coat. And they threw their own clothes on the coat. And they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was drawn near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that he had done. Let me stop that. Let me just stop this is If somebody asks you why you praise God, why do you praise Him? Why do you show up on Sunday sometime and, and, and just be there for the purpose? What would your answer be? What would you tell them? This scripture says that the whole multitude, they rejoice. And they praise God. He becomes in on a donkey, on a coat. And they rejoice him and they are praising him. And why? For all the mighty works that they had seen. Have you seen God do anything mighty in your life? Have you seen 
in a mighty work taking place. Let me tell you something. God is still giving sight to the blind. God is still causing the cripple to walk. God is still healing those who are sick. God is still giving us peace of mind in the midst of trouble and tribulation. Have you seen all the great work that he has done? What has he done for you? What's on your list? I tell you right now, I've seen him heal a man who had heart surgery. I've seen him put him back in the pulpit. What have you seen? Have God done anything mighty in your life? You should have a great reception of praise. You should have a song in your heart. Yeah. Every time you think about what God has done for you, anybody know what I'm talking about? And you can praise Him. And you can sing to Him all by yourself. You don't need a choir. You can, you can still cry all by yourself. It says that they began to sing and rejoice for all the mighty works. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Peace in heaven and glory in the most high. Peace in heaven. Peace. Have you ever brought you peace? Oh, come on. Now. Come on. Anybody, anybody ever found peace in Jesus that you couldn't find anywhere else? Thank you, Lord. That's part of his mighty works taking place in your life, your life, and in your life. Amen. You should praise him every day for that. And guess what? Listen to this part. And some of the Pharisees, there's always a Pharisee, <laughs> called to him from the crowd. Listen to what they got to say. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. In other words, the people who were against Jesus, they saw all the multitude praising Jesus. Praising Him. And they, remember those are the ones that had that contract out on Jesus. So they couldn't like go after him then because they were outnumbered. But they didn't like the praise. And I'm going to tell you something. Nothing makes Satan more mad than to see you praising God. So I want you to keep him mad. Let him be mad. He jumped up on my Rebuke him. Rebuke. Tell him to shut up. No, no, no. Don't shut up. The more they try to shut you up, the louder you should get praising God. Don't let God, because this was Jesus' day to be praised. This was his victorious day, and he was to be honored. And another part of that scripture says that the people began to take off their clothes and throw their coats on them. For him to ride. Amen. Now understand back then, they didn't have a closet full of suits like all of you have right now. They might have a few shirts here and there. So when they threw their shirts, that was some serious admiration and recognition of Jesus as Lord, Amen. as powerful as God. And remember this, he was rejected, but at the same time, he was praised. He knew, he knew something. And when you study the gospel, you're going to see this about Jesus. Almost everywhere, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when he encountered people and he would work miracles and then they would come out honoring him and praise him, he said, no, 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 don't say anything. Don't tell anybody about it. Be quiet. He wasn't seeking that glory. Right. right? But on this day, on this day, he knew that this was his last week in his life. And so on this day, he didn't tell them to be silent. Listen to what he said. When, when, when the Pharisees tried to shut him up, listen to what he said. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, if these people don't praise me right now, the stones will immediately begin to cry out. 
He said, if you keep silent, the rocks will start praising me. The rocks, you know, and God can use nature to praise him. When sometimes you see the wind blowing, it's just praising the Lord. Sometimes you see the rain coming down, it's just praising the Lord. God can use nature to praise him. Thank you. He can send a fish to get Jonah. God can do anything he wants to to show his praise of his Praise him. I was like, you know, I never heard a rock talk. That would be something, amen. But God can make a rock talk and praise him. So he's not going to shut you up, and he's not going to let anybody shut you up. He wants you to praise him. He wants you to praise him. And he might make your enemies uncomfortable, but praise him anyway. They may object to your praise, but praise him anyway. Yes. Nothing makes Satan mad than to see you praising God. When God's people start worshiping and their hearts and their minds are set on him, and then Satan is losing the battle. Yes, he is. Sin is not winning. Satan is distracted. And he don't know what to do when you come to Church shouting, amen. All up and down the aisle. He don't understand that. But you should tell Satan that I can't help but stop. I can't help but praise you. And I don't want no stone doing what I need to do. And I tell you, on that day, the stone did not have to do anything because the people kept on praising God. And don't you allow any stone to take this place. Amen. Keep on praising Him. Yes. Worship and praise. Yes. Yes. Worship and praise. This scripture is teaching us that praising God sincerely and acknowledging Him sincerely is what we all need to do. Amen. And we don't need to do it. Listen, don't just go home and get in the shower and start shouting. Amen. <laughs> Sometimes you got to do it in the club, okay? Amen. See, Jesus and those people, they were not hiding out from the Pharisees or anything. They were doing it right there in the public. you got to learn how to be very bold with your faith. You know, if Satan see you afraid to shout and talk about Christ, he's going to always be trying to intimidate you because he knows that he can shut you up. But you got to be bold. You got to learn how to recognize that the real authority in this world is Jesus. And knowing that should cause us to wholeheartedly follow him. Not just when it's convenient, but at all times. All times. Learn something. Learn something from Jesus here. They were rejecting him. And in life, if you've been a Christian long enough, somebody has rejected you for being a Christian. Yes. And it's not going to be just out people at your work, people you meet in the street. Some of it is going to be right in your family. Yes. Praise God. Somebody in your household is going to reject you. But this tells us to stand firm in your faith in the midst of opposition. Stand firm. And trust God. Trust in his power. Trust in his strength to bring you through all forms of opposition. Now, the last portion of our lesson tonight, uh, today, is almost my <laughs> comes from Luke 19, verses 41 through 44. And this is a very strange and interesting portion of Scripture. You know, they had translators of the Bible. Some of the translators of some scriptures took this out. But it's in the King James Version and other versions, but they took this portion out, and I'll tell you why. Let me read it and then I'll tell you. <laughs> Verses 41 through 44. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, 
even you, especially in your day, the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side and level you and your children within to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now, I don't want you to miss the content. Listen. As he drew near, he saw the city and he started crying. Now, the point that they take it out is that this portion here, they didn't want people to read the Bible and see God crying. Yeah, some translations have taken it out. And they figured that if we see a crying God, we see a weak God. They wanted to project him as having strength over everything and nothing can bother him to the point that it would make him cry. But it says Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Now, let me, let me see. I just told you earlier that he knew that he was going to be crucified. So if there was any reason to weep, <laughs> that's a good reason to cry. Amen. Praise God. You know, you know you're getting ready to be crucified. But that's not why he was crying. So you say, well, why was he crying? Did you kick or did you miss it? <laughs> you see, he says that he wept over it. That's Jerusalem. He says, if you had known there was something that they didn't know. <clears throat> you know, God can be right before our eyes and do miraculous things and we still don't know that it's God. He said that if they had known, even you, especially in your day, there were going to be days coming later that we're going to believe. But you should believe because I'm here right in front of you in your day. And right in your day, you will not believe. So he wasn't weeping for himself. He was weeping for Jerusalem because he knew what was going to happen to Jerusalem because Jerusalem did not believe. You know, I don't know why this came as a shock to me. But when Darius and I were in uh, Israel and we were in Jerusalem, we would go to various little spots and they would stop and give us various lectures at the Garden of Gethsemane or Nazareth or the Jordan River, wherever we were. And on one of those occasions, we went to this church that Jesus had visited. The temple was at the end of this chapel. He went in there. Remember, he was cleaning out the temple and telling people, you den, the feed, you den, and all that. But well, we went there. And while we were there, the statement was made that the Jewish population that was there, less than 5% of them are Christians. 95% of them there are not Christians. And you know what that means? They still don't know. They still don't know. They're holding on to traditional ideas, yes. and they still don't know. And what Jesus is going to tell them, it says that because you don't know, if what you don't know causes you to act in a certain way, and that way is basically not to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And when you reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he says something is going to happen to you. And that's why I'm crying, because I know what's going to happen to you. He says, for the day will come upon you when your enemy will encamp you all around you. And it happened in A.D. 70. About 40 years after this prophecy, the Roman government came down. And listen to this. You think what's going on in Gaza is a shame right now. They killed millions of Jews, the Roman soldiers. And the historians, the sequels, and all of them write about it right now. But why? Because 
They were in rejection of Jesus. And I tell you right now, a lot of stuff that you bring into your life has to do to your rejection of Jesus. If they had really known, they would have gone in a different direction. But because you don't know, your enemy will take over you. He will bank you in. He will take over your life. Your enemy will control you and have you crawling on the ground. You might not understand that, but look at all these drug addicts out there who don't know Jesus. Look at them. Look at them out there killing each other because they don't know Jesus. Look at all these young people going to prison and doing all this crazy stuff because they don't know Jesus. If they had known the Lord, they would be right in here right now, praising God, raising up all their hands. Their children would be happy, their parents would be happy, and their brothers and sisters would be happy. If they had known. And not knowing Jesus brings all these things about in our lives. So he began to weep. And we should thank God that we have a compassionate God. Amen. We have a God whose tears are not for himself, but because of the lost opportunities that we have because we act like we don't know him. His desire was to deliver Jerusalem from those fake Pharisees. But they kept going in the way that they wanted to go. His desire was not to bring war, but to bring peace. But sometimes, spiritual blindness <coughs> of the leadership yes. will cause those that follow them to suffer yes. and go blind in yes. the process. Yes. Oh, you might say, well, Reverend, don't get political, but I'm going to get political. Let me tell you something. That incident that took place in Washington, D.C. on January 6th, a couple of years ago, all those people are in prison. One of them, I never will forget, he was about 35 years old, and he got a sentence of about 40 years, six, a lot of time. And he was crying to the judge, talking about, I am not going to be able to see my daughter grow up and graduate and get married all because of that. But you know why it happened? Because you allow a blind leader to lead you into a foolish act that destroys your life and that blind leader is not suffering but you are. Listen, don't allow leaders who are being directed by evil spirits to cause you to lose your salvation. Praise God. Do what is right. Do what is right. Amen. No, God. Yes. No of his miracles. Yes. No of his ministry. Yes. No that he was the Messiah on a mission to deliver us into salvation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Thank you Lord. Yes. But this is a wake-up call. Yes, this is your day like it was their day. This is your day to know Jesus. Praise God. It's your opportunity to recognize him as king. And once you do that, then you will receive multitudes of blessings. He cried because he had compassion for others. Let me tell you something. We should not just be happy because we are living pretty good. Amen. You should have compassion for all those who are starving there right now. You should have compassion for somebody that you've seen on the street. Yes. God cried over this. So we should be moved by it. We should be moved by it. Listen. As I close, let me tell you something. There are consequences connected to your actions. And the worst consequence that you would ever had is to reject Jesus Christ right now. Yes. There's consequences yes. that are connected to that. And right now, maybe you may come into church, but deep in your heart, have you really got to know him? There's still time yes. to really seek deep knowledge and forgiveness of him. Yes. Listen, brothers and sisters, 
sin is serious. Sin is serious. And divine judgment is connected to the sin of rejecting Jesus. So remember, recognize him. Recognize him. And I am grateful that when we read the scriptures, we see, in fact, that the word of God is always pointing to him being king. Even when he was born, there came wise men asking the question, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? But well, we saw it start, even the universe point to him. Yes. And we saw it go that we have come to worship him. Yes. And when he was being questioned, are you the king? Mm -hmm. Jesus says, yes, I'm king. But I, what I want you to know that my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is of another place. And yes, you are king here, Pilate, but in heaven forever I am eternally king. I am king of the world. Yeah. And when you get to the book of Revelation, we can go in there and it says that he's going to have a robe on. And then on that robe is going to say, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. And the scripture says that his kingdom is never, never, ever going to be in. He's going to be king. Yeah.